Hi, I'm Dr. Şengül Özdek from Gazi University, Ankara, Turkey. Pediatric retinal pathologies and their treatments are complex topics which necessitates unique considerations and challenges. Welcome to the EVRS 2024 roundtable discussions at this year's Media Wall for an engaging panel session on pediatric vitretinal pathologies and their treatments. We have great panelists from Hyderabad, Paris, and Michigan. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Shengul. Uh, my name is Chara Vesterli. I'm an associate professor and director of pediatric retina at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Thank you. I'm Alejandra Darvic from uh, Necker Hospital in Paris, that is part of uh, Paris Cité University. Thank you. Hi, so wonderful to be with all of you. I'm Dr. Subhadra Jalali. I'm a pediatric retina specialist working at the LV Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad, India. So, I have some questions. The first one is, what are the most critical issues we are facing today in pediatric vitreoretinal pathologies, and why should we be paying closer attention to these conditions? I'm sure I can, you know, just, there are many of them, but maybe just one to start with would be retinopathy prematurity. We have a lot of babies are living longer, they did more extremely premature babies surviving, and ROP rates are going increasing, and we're also finding that these um, children ha are having um, uh, retinal issues, retinal pathologies later in life. Not only we have to treat them when they're infants, but we also have to continue to follow them and treat them as they move into adulthood. Um, there, there are multiple studies now showing that the, 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 this is a lifelong issue. Thank you. Maybe in a more global point of view, I think that it's important that to, to recognize early diagnosis because that it will be very important for the prognosis of visual function of these children. And children uh, do not complain of the pathology. Normally, if it's unilateral, children did not, do not realize of the law of visual acuity. And um, general ophthalmologists are not um, comfortable for examining children and to uh, have a very early diagnosis. So it is important to be aware of that uh, and to pay attention to, to children and to screen uh, these children. So that comes to the screening. So Yeah, I would like to say it from a public health perspective, especially from my part of the world, Asia, Africa, that millions of children used to die. We had a very high neonatal mortality. But now for the last 10 years, because of the efforts to have the sustainable development goals, a lot of these children are being survived by excellent neonatal care. And so not only ROP, but a large number of retina problems and other eye problems in newborns, which were sort of hidden because the babies were dying, are now coming up. And the systems are not in place for these survivors to have their eye care. So I think that's why, at least in my part of the world, it's become a very emergent epidemic problem. Yeah, it's not the ROP, as you said. We have, you know, congenital cataracts, PFEs, fevers, many, many other diseases which needs to be detected earlier. But since we don't have a universal eye screening program, just some, you know, red light, um, red reflex screening like things, but those does not help in all pathologies. So we need something like universal screening for neonatal patients, I guess. Yeah, I think maybe if I can add, we're not, we're fighting two battles. One is the retinal disease, the other one is amblyopia. So that's where I think it really comes together. Early detection and treatment is critical um, because at some point it's difficult to kind of, you know, reverse that visual loss. Also, I think that, you know, we realize that a vision loss in early infancy affects the overall development of that child hugely as compared to, let's say, any other sensory organ which is affected because 80% of learning in a newborn is through seeing. And if they don't see, they don't develop in all spheres, whether it's motor, cognitive, you know, all sorts of so things. So what's the strategy in your countries for the newborns or for the, uh, for the first year? Do you have any routine uh, screening programs in your countries? 
So I'm very uh, happy to report that in India we now have, since 2016, on paper, at least, universal newborn eye screening guidelines, uh, both for the normal newborns and for preterms. And recently, in 2024, March, the WHO, South Asian edition of WHO, has released newborn eye screening guidelines universally for the first time, along with universal hearing and thyroid. And it's surprising that till today we didn't have eye screening of newborns as part of newborn care. But and who is doing that? Uh, the pediatricians or the ophthalmologists? So they're still to operationalize it, but we've got the triage, the systems, the guidelines, at least as I said, on paper. And now the question comes, who is the champion? Who is going to do it? And how is it going to be rolled out? And what about USA? In the U.S., there's no universal screening for newborns. You know, we do screen for retinopathy prematurity and infants at risk for ROP. Um, but um, the, the most screening is done by the pediatricians, the red reflex test that you just mentioned, which, as we know, is not a very sensitive test. Um, there are innovators in the field working on this. Um, people like Darius Mashfagi, I think they're, they're really kind of big proponents of developing new tools for new, newborn screening. So I think, you know, the, this field is evolving. What about Paris? Well, we have a screening for ROP, of course, but there is no uh, an ophthalmologist universal screening for all newborn. There are um, pediatric examination of the eyes that is for all babies, but not with fundus examination as we know as ophthalmologists. Yeah, it's the same in Turkey too. We only have red reflex screening and it's not so sensitive. And um, when we were doing our OP screening in some of the babies, we detect quite a lot of other pathologies. So we need something to do uh, with the routine uh, neonatal screening. But at least I think we should detect the uh, high risk uh, newborns to do the, uh, the screening like, you know, difficult delivery or vaginal delivery or neonatal asphyxia or thrombocytopenia. So babies with those pathologies needs to be screened more, I guess, routinely. Yeah, so we, in the WHO guidelines, where I was also one of the experts, we put in a group of high vulnerable normal children, normal delivery. So this included all syndromic babies, all babies who had sepsis for more than two weeks, and all difficult cases, and especially all children with family history, because that gets missed in routine care. So if anybody had a family history, so this question needs to be asked. And they should have, you know, uh, not only newborn eye screening, but even prenatal counseling uh, before they get pregnant of whether my child has a risk of eye problem in the next sibling. So which cutting edge uh, technologies do you use to detect these pathologies in pediatric group? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, it's often it's it's you know wide field cameras, the contact cameras that we use for the for the infants or small children. Um, this could be in the hospital on the bedside. It could be in an operating room under anesthesia. And as they get older, I think what really changed my practice is these wide field cameras in office, being able to do wide field photography, being able to do wide field fluorescent angiography. It's really, I think, sort of given us better tools to detect these diseases catch problems early or monitor response to treatment? Yeah, so I would like to say two things. One is using technology for screening and reaching out. And we are very happy with the teleconsult model where on our camera we put Zoom and we can do live telescreening with the parents. We can uh, tell the technician which area to image if we are not happy with the image that they have put up. So it's a very active live screening that we are doing in the remotest areas with teams going out and the ophthalmologist not needing to go out. And this can be replicated in many places. And the parents are also now, after the COVID epidemic, more tuned to you know, using these digital platforms to have discussions rather than having face-to-face -face discussions. The other thing, yes, uh, we not only use the wide field cameras, but we've, you know, put in place even the adult cameras and even the normal iPhone can be used with a 20D lens and we are training people to use normal cameras. Uh, so I think in today's time, there's no reason why a trained person should not be able to take a picture of the retina. There are a variety of 
you know, instruments now available from low cost to high cost, but still, I think that technology gap is there. We don't still have something like an eye stetho, something which an health worker can put on the eye, take a picture. I think that technology should be able to help us there, but it's not there. So, what are the barriers to use these technologies for you, for example? Uh, for I think that the most um, important barrier is the the, um, the financial problem of uh, of this um, equipment that is not available everywhere and and this um, viability in the different geographic uh, zone. Um, well, it's, it's it's difficult That's to, to have it everywhere. Yeah, and I guess the um, cell phone uh, based imaging also helps and it's very cheap so the um, many people are now producing something like to use it easier to, to make it easier to use the cell phone for these imaging uh, purposes i guess i think one of the important barriers because i'm very hopeful that you know coordinated work we you know conquered smallpox when we didn't have any technology and we conquered it around the world we conquered polio you know on the ground when high-tech technologies were not there. So I think one of the barriers is a lack of perception and awareness that this is a public health problem, it can be tackled. And while we might need some technology, but more important is the frontline workers who are passionate about the thing, who can go and do it. Because I find that even when I have the technology and I, I'm going out, but the acceptance in the public or in the professionals is like, Really? A newborn baby needs an eye checkup? Why? You know, so I think we need to break that barrier of acceptance, awareness, and then the technology will move in. These are social barriers, actually. You know, some of the parents say that if you put some drugs to, to the eye of my baby, they may get some seizures, some fever. They, 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 they have asked to Google, you know, <laughs> Dr. Google, and they have seen that. So then when, when you just want to do that, they may put some barrier. Yeah. So we need to... Um, we more need education. To... More education for families, for parents. Yeah. Uh, to... Make them aware of, you know, uh, the pathologies, the, the potential pathologies, so that if, uh, because this is a very important public health problem, when the, these pathologies happens in pediatric cases, especially during the first seven years, six to seven years, it may be uh, it not possible to make it better after that. So it's an irreversible condition after that. That's why it's very important to do it on time. Yeah, I think money is also not that critical. You know, when I started 30 years back, the red cam was $180,000. Now I'm using the forest, which is like $10,000. You know, when the number of babies in my country, 23 million babies are born every year. Each one of them needs an eye checkup. You know, when, when the program moves, the money will come and the cost of care will also come down. What advancements and shifts in attitudes do you foresee in pediatric with retinal care that could improve treatment outcomes for young patients? I mean, I think maybe I'll come back to the education piece that you mentioned. It's not just educating, I think absolutely educating the public, but also educating policymakers, as well as educating the future physicians. I think the advancement that what, what we can, the immediate, I think, uh, impact we can make is just making our trainees or fellows more aware of pediatric renal diseases so they're the more comfortable taking care of these children so you know, there's a better outreach, that more accessibility for these patients. Right. And also, I think we should also uh, just make sure that the Ministry of Health should be in, in this policy. Otherwise, it's not just one person thing, you know. Uh, they should awake the public maybe by preparing some um, television announcements, something like that, so that uh, it may help to, um, to make the public more aware of this. 
I think it's also important to have more financial support for research on pediatric retina because there are a lot of things that we don't understand very well and we can improve uh, treatment, our adjuvant treatment to surgery and it is important to, to do research. I think two attitudes I would say. One, we need a global brand ambassador. You know, look how HIV worked out. There were two or three, you know, global brand ambassadors. And they put it on the top of all other disorders. So, you know, if we have a global brand ambassador, because there's a problem globally, and we need collaboration, cooperation with all, you know, different people from different regions, because problem is one. The solutions may be different. And the second is, I think that the ownership of picking up, finding these and screening should be with the pediatrician and with the child health care workers and not with ophthalmologists. After all, the polio program was not owned by orthopedicians and neurologists. It would never succeed. Only when the IEK program is taken up by the pediatricians with whom these children are, I think we can fight the childhood blindness and the newborn blindness together. Even family physicians. Family physicians, yeah. yeah. Is there any questions from the audience? Please. Yeah, I shape it. Uh, what do you think uh, about artificial intelligence will uh, stand in pediatric pathologies? So, I, I mean, that's an excellent question, and a great example of that is ROP. Um, as you know, as we know, there's there there are multiple studies in the in, in you know recently showing that diagnosis of ROP can be improved by AI and can also help us sort of identify uh, infants at risk, so we can actually use that. To, to refer those babies to treatment centers? I think it has two sides. <clears throat> One side, it decreased the necessity, necessity for the uh, specialists, I mean, I mean the pediatric retina specialists, decreased the number, but it necessitates high technology. So you need to have the captures. So it has both sides, positives and negatives, I guess. I think it's very important in the future, probably, but we have now a lot of uh, barriers that we have to, to take in consideration before um, artificial intelligence. I mean, we have to structure better the screening program, the health policies uh, before to introduce AI in our practice. I think so. I think I'm not an AI person, but I can tell you that if you need one health issue which has the best AI potential, it is the newborn baby's eyes. Because the newborn baby's eyes, whether it is anterior segment or the retina, is pristine, same all over the world. The color is little different, but every eye has the same clear cornea, clear lens, dilating pupil, and an optic disc, and few vessels, and a pristine retina. So it is quite easy for AI to say something is abnormal. It may not tell immediately in the first triation of AI that it's serious or not serious, but there is an eye problem is so much conducive to an AI. Anybody should be able to put that lo a logarithm in place. I agree. The science has been throughoutly evaluated, surgical techniques refined, and key barriers identified. Now we can concentrate on executing effective action plans to achieve the best outcomes for pediatric patients. Thank you. <laughs>